thank you very much for your informative presentation, Dr. Lombard. Um, and today, Dr. Brown is our second speaker who will be sharing with us his presentation on the major moral and theological challenges that Muslims face in the post-9-11 Western states that push Muslims to alter their epistemology. With that, I ask you to give your attention to Dr. Brown. The floor is yours, Dr. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm uh, very happy to be here. I wasn't here yesterday when we had the opening session because I was still on my airplane or in the customs or something like that. So it wasn't because I forgot. Anyway, um, I also am kind of filled with regret about the topic I picked because it's clearly so broad that uh, there's no possible way I could do it justice. So I tried to approach it in a way that I thought would make sense. Um, I'm also, I don't know, I think, you know, in the U.S. we talk about American exceptionalism, this problem of Americans thinking America is special and Americans are special. And uh, the problem is even when you start criticizing that, you end up thinking you're special for thinking that. And everything I try to do whenever I try to approach this issue, I end up kind of stuck in an American Muslim lens. Uh, so I think I'm going to end up talking a bit about the U.S. maybe more than um, other places, but that's just because that's where I'm from and that's the life I live. So if it's useful, um, hopefully it'll be of use to you. Otherwise, it might just be interesting. Okay, so the first point is uh, actually kind of a big question about, um, you know, what is the, the big sort of question, what is the big issue of um, the nature of Islamic law and, and doctrine or the role of religion in life in general. And the, the big question for the past roughly three or 400 years has been, um, is, is Islam or is any religion, uh, is it essential? Does it transcend history? Or is it contingent? Is it part of history? Uh, you might think of it as, as being, uh, do, is religion a, a, a de deposit of truth in the world? And that uh, well, it might not govern all events. It certainly should be the thing that governs people as they move through the events of history. Or is religion just part of human culture and it's produced by history and historical contingent historical circumstances like everything else is produced? If you can imagine, sort of one is a, a view that the first one sees religion as something that comes from God into this world. And the other one that is simply sees religion essentially as a product that human beings create. And then when they don't need it anymore, they turn to other things. Um, if you think that a religion is essential, that is trans-historical, that it uh, embodies some kind of trans-historical truth, then you have a question, right? Um, clearly, uh, Circumstances change, technologies change, societies differ from one another, and uh, elements of how one understands religion, or let's say how one understands Islamic law, will change based on different times and places. As everyone knows in Islamic law, al ahkam al ghayr bil makan wa zaman wa nidam wa al-ashkhas wa al-anzima. Some rulings change, not the core rulings, but some rulings change based on time and place and conditions and systems and people. But... Uh, uh, do all rulings change? Does religious, pre-modern religious law simply lose validity? Is, are the only um, essential elements of religion just basic ethical principles like love God, be nice to people, treat other people as you want to be treated? I mean, rules that are, that are good rules, but they're so kind of vague and um, agreed upon that they really don't manifest themselves in any controversial way. Uh, or are there aspects of revealed law that are actually supposed to remain concrete and guide humans even as their societies change and sort of guide and control that change. So you can think in, in Islamic law about issues, let's say, gender. Um, is, there, is there a prohibition on zina? And that prohibition on zina should change. It should, should remain uh, the same. It should never uh, disappear. It shouldn't disappear just because human beings decide marriage is old-fashioned or, or decide that consent and happiness is the only thing that makes uh, sexual interaction uh, correct. In, the, in the economics, economics, you can think of riba. Is, does the Sharia give a, a prohibition on, on interest, on taking and giving interest, or at least taking interest, and that this should remain constant despite the change in the world economy, and that, in fact, it should guide people to avoiding interest-bearing transactions, the kind of economic systems and financial systems that that creates and that, that, that need that. Um, in, just in terms of identity, uh, is, there, is the ummah something real? 
Is the Ummah something real that, uh, sure, it was a, a thing in the past when there was Islamic civilization, the Dar al Islam, and there was Christendom, and, but then, uh, you know, the age of the nation state dawned, and now we have, you know, postmodern world of uh, information technology and trans global, transnational elites and corporations, and this stuff doesn't matter anymore. Or is there always supposed to be something called the Ummah? Are Muslims always supposed to identify with one another and see uh, in other Muslims people who share their, their, their morality and to whom they have loyalty and that? that loyalty means something in the world. Um, if you believe that there are aspects of Islamic law and dogma that are, are impervious to historical change, that are supposed to remain there forever and always guide us, but you also believe that there are certain laws that change according to time, which, as far as I know, all Islamic schools of law believe, there are certain laws that change according to time and place, how do you know the difference between the two groups? How do you know? For example, I mean, you can see this even very on in Islam Islamic law. The, all the schools of law, except for the Hanafis, thought that the group, the al um, Qulubuhum, the group that one of the groups that can uh, get zakat, al Mu'allafa Qulubuhum, that this group only existed in the time of the Prophet, and after that they don't exist anymore. So that that Quranic verse that talks about that. It's no longer applicable. The other schools of law all said, no, no, this group exists uh, eternally. They're, they're always there in any time, in any place. Um, so even there at the beginning of Islam, there's, there's a disagreement about our, how do we understand this Quranic verse? Is this law supposed to be eternal or is it supposed to change and kind of disappear when, when, when uh, circumstances change? But how do we, that, those were the companions in the early Muslim community who had, were deeply grounded in their religion, who felt confident, who didn't feel like they were being uh, pulled uh, between different uh, types of hegemonic domination by non-Muslim forces. How, how are we supposed to know what's supposed to change and what's supposed to, what can change and what's supposed to stay the same? Uh, this is all greatly intensified in the last 250, roughly 250, 300 years, when humanity, ha during which humanity has gone through unprecedented socio-economic, technological, and political change. I mean, from the time that human beings settled down in agricultural communities, well, roughly, you know, 10,000 BC or something like that, 10, 7,000 BC, until the 1700s, humanity was basically the same. And in the last 300 years, the socioeconomic change we've gone through, technological change we've gone through, is just unprecedented in human history. And you can forget the last 250 years. Try the last 70 years. Try, you know, time, the time between when I was growing up and you didn't have cell phones or iPhones or Internet and people growing up now. How are we, in, with this rapidity of, and, and, uh, and, and immense uh, uh, sort of drama of change, uh, these que the question of what is supposed to stay the same, what's, what is allowed to change, becomes even more fraught and pressing. Now, it, but it's important to remember that uh, we're not the first Muslims who have gone through uh, dramatic change. And a lot of times we forget about this, but the, early, the, the, the first two generations of Muslims, and in fact even just the first generation of Muslims, went through and experienced immense change. They went from being uh, traders, small-scale traders, merchants, and Bedouins and her, you know, camel herders living in Western Arabia who had very little in contact with the rest of the world to the ruling class of the Near East, ruling over all of essentially the southern Mediterranean, eastern Mediterranean, Iran, Central Asia. So they experienced immense change. And it's very interesting that you can see in that time period Muslims, scholars engaging in the same kind of discussions we engage in today about, for example, is this Quranic verse supposed to be for all times or is this Quranic verse only supposed to be for certain circumstances? So it's a little known example, but it's very interesting. The, the Quranic verse that talks about thalath awratin, there's three different times when you're kind of in a pri you're undressing or you're in your home undressing or, uh, during the, the uh, fajr prayer around dinner time and at night. These are the times when people, your servants working in your house or your children are supposed to knock on the door before they come in. And uh, in a hadith in Sunnah of Abu Dawood, uh, some people come from Iraq during the time of Ibn Abbas. So this is during the time of the companions. They come to Iraq. Uh, to uh, Mecca and they visit Ibn Abbas and they say, you know, people in Iraq, we're not, they don't act on this verse anymore. No one's doing this thing of knocking for doing these three times of the day. And Ibn Abbas explains, well, when we lived in, um, in Mecca, Medina, the houses had no internal divisions. There was no curtains or anything. So, you know, when you open the door to a house, there was just the house. And if you're naked in there, then 
you're naked. There's no, there's no, you know, other room or there's no in internal door or, or a curtain or anything like that. So now you're living in big houses with locked doors and internal, uh, you know, mansions and things. So you don't need this, this verse anymore. So you can see even in that time period, they're starting to see some of these verses don't apply anymore. Now, the, the problem is when we try to have that discussion today, we can't have it from a position of confidence. We can't have it from a position of feeling like we're making an a independent um, kind of indigenous decision about our religion, everything gets sucked into this, these, between these two poles of tradition and modernity, right? So take the example of the verses in the Quran about inheritance. Uh, we, we, some of the most clear verses in the Quran about any legal issue. For example, that a daughter gets one half the inheritance of a son. There's, no one can debate that these are historically reliable. No one can debate these are part of the Quran. And Muslim scholars have always agreed that this rule is binding, and they've never said that this means, this, this depends on changing circumstances or changing economies. This is always the case. Of course, Muslims can do things like have wasiya, they can put their money in waqf, they can, uh, if all of the inheritors agree that some of the wasiya can go to one of the inheritors, etc., etc. But uh, it, now when we try to have it, if we have that debate, if you say that, oh, this Quranic verse was only meant for a certain time, you become a sellout. You become kind of someone who's an agent of, of a, you know, a Western culture, of a, a global, Western, global Western elite or something like that. And if you say, no, 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 the Quran says half uh, share for, uh, half the son shares goes to the daughter, they say, you're a backward person. You're a, you're a benighted, medieval, retrograde human being. Right? So at no point in this discussion is there just what you think is the right answer. Your answer is predetermined. And it's going to be acceptable to some people and not acceptable to others based on these two kind of poles of, what, of, of determining how Muslims should act. Um, but, of course, the fascinating thing is because of the immense change that human beings have gone through in the past 250 years, or in this case, the last 100 years, we have a, an, an interesting predicament. Uh, maybe the reason no one ever debated these Quranic, the verse on inheritance, like they discussed the Wallafa Qulubuhum issue, is because no human society had gone through the kind of economic revolution that human societies have gone through in the last 250 years, particularly in the last 100 years, when in many parts of the world, women have that equal role, equal legal rights, uh, uh, arguably, a, a, certainly a sizable role in the economy, and um, arguably equal role in the economy, right? So, um, is it that this verse was supposed to always remain the same and never change regardless of circumstance? Or is it simply the fact that circumstances had never changed sufficiently in order for that debate to emerge today? We, Muslims can't even have that debate because if you take one side, you're going to be labeled as you know, backward traditional. If you take the other side, you're going to be labeled as a modernist sellout. And so how are Muslims supposed to have a, a, a confident indigenous discussion about this? And one, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm actually very happy that Professor Osak gave his, I wasn't here for it, but he gave his talk about progressive Islam yesterday because it's very important for people to understand different kind of fissures within that category, the political motivations of some people in that group. And, but I would just say in general, not, in it, not talking about progressive Islam in a problematic way, but if you want to think about Islamic modernism or reformist Islam or progressive Islam on one side and kind of traditional Islam on the other, one could probably say that the main difference between these two approaches to our religion is that traditional Muslims assume that any rule provided in the Quran or the Hadith or the, the Sunnah or the um, agreed upon by the schools of law is assumed to be valid for all time and place unless there's some kind of strong evidence from the Quran and the Sunnah that it should change based on circumstances. Whereas kind of Islamic modernists or progressive or reformist Muslims would say, no, the assumption is that any law can change based on changing uh, uh, circumstances. Okay. So but what's, what's very important to note is that quote-unquote traditionalist Muslims are not averse to reform. They're not averse to discussing reform. At least they shouldn't be. They simply want a very good argument. They want an argument that's good enough to make them overturn 1,400 years of tradition, uh, not just the idea that, oh, of course, everything's supposed to change based on time and place and based on what we think is culturally acceptable today. Okay, so that's the first part I want to talk about. Two minutes left? Five minutes left. Okay, I'll try to do my best. Um, this is about the, the U.S. context. And, um, of course, we have to uh, look at how the past uh, 200 years of the colonial period has influenced 
uh, Muslim education, the Muslim view of their own, of Muslims view of their own sciences. So as uh, the medrasa system and its traditional Islamic education was replaced by secular universities, um, and as the study of Islam from a traditional clerical perspective was replaced by the Western study of Islam of the outsider, or the historian, or the sociologist, or the political scientist, or the uh, Orientalist, or the Near Eastern Languages and Civilization scholar, like the place I graduated from. Um, the, the gra gradually, the, the power of who gets to define Islam in the hegemonic world order of the colonial and post-colonial world has moved from traditionally educated Muslim scholars to uh, Western scholars who come from a perspective that uh, treats religion cynically, that, that materializes the forces that shape religion. Um, and then a second major development happened. This is, I think, really in the U.S. you can chart after 9-11, which is that uh, a class of Muslim scholars, academics, you know, in, in, in the academies has been created whose purpose, whether they know it or not, is to not just to deconstruct Islam, and the Islamic world and the notion of the Ummah, but to, to uh, uh, dismantle it, completely dismantle uh, anything that's called Islam or the Islamic world or Muslim identity or the Ummah or the Muslim community or notions of solidarity. Right? And it does so not through a, the modernist perspective, which was the one, one that accompanied the kind of the colonial uh, project, but through the postmodernist perspective, which, which tries to essentially dismantle everything that has any meaning. Uh, you can think about this in, it certainly, it mostly occurs in the field of religious studies in the United States. And uh, the, the main principle behind it is that there is nothing called Islam. There is no uh, essential thing called Islam. Um, Islam is just whatever Muslims say it is. So if you think that, you know, if we just get together and decide that, you know, Islam is based on me opening and closing this computer 50 times and then we all say, I mean, that becomes Islam. If Islam is about the Quran, that's Islam. If Islam is about this cup of water, that's Islam, right? It doesn't matter. There's no tie to any text. There's no tie to any revelation. And you're certainly not bound by a discursive tradition that keeps people in a conversation with their past. Um, so uh, oftentimes if you, in, when, from, in this group of academics, if you talk about Islam, they'll say, well, there's no such thing as Islam. Right? There is no, how can you talk about any Islam in any authoritative way? If you talk about the Islamic world, they'll say there's no such thing as the Islamic world. If you talk about the Prophet Muhammad, they'll say, uh, I remember one, I was so shocked by this. This one professor put a, a picture, someone had drawn a picture of the Prophet Muhammad as a, uh, as a woman, which is just not accurate, right? Not that, nothing against women, it's just not, he wasn't the woman. So, and this person said, if anybody says that the Prophet wasn't a woman, that person is like a backward uh, human being. I don't want to have anything to do with them. So that's the kind of, even, even just basic statements about the Prophet Muhammad become unacceptable in this, in this school of thought. And what this does is it doesn't just dismantle Islam as a religion. It actually robs Muslims of even their anything aspirational. So if you have an aspiration, if you say, no, there is something called Islam. There is something called the Quran and the Sunnah. There is something called the Islamic world. There is something called the Ummah. You can't even have these aspirations because these aspirations become impositions on other people that you're not allowed to have. How dare you try and speak authoritatively? How dare anybody? So by, by constantly cutting and dismantling systems and cutting down voices, undercutting them, what this does is it assures that, that Muslims are incapable of any uh, constructive process. Now, this uh, kind of group of, uh, of who are essentially, as far as I know, only are restricted to universities in the U.S. You don't see imams with these ideas. You don't see Muslim community leaders with these ideas. But uh, we have to remember that these processes work very slow. And if you're interested in this, I recommend going back to the 2007 Rand uh, Corporation report called Building Moderate Muslim Networks. And sometimes when people get very skeptical about stuff, they read, remember, projects don't just take one year or two years. These things, go, these things take decades. If you go back and look at this report the Rand Corporation did, this is essentially what has been done in the United States. Um, through government encouragement, through giving money for charitable and uh, philanthropic and educational foundations, giving money to certain people, not to other people, by universities giving jobs to certain people, not other people, by media take t paying attention to certain people, not other people. Uh, Muslims who have traditional, let's say, worldviews or, or let's say politically active Muslims who believe that their religion um, gives them a, a voice about justice in the Muslim world 
as a Muslim, right? Uh, those people will be marginalized. They won't be given access to resources. And people who are essentially politically neutered and people who are uh, committed to deconstructing traditional Islam and d dismantling it, these people will have been and uh, remain promoted, right? Um, the, uh, 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 another feature of this phenomenon, this type of scholar in the U.S. now, is it's not just religious studies, but you can also think of it taking place in post-colonial studies. So before, like a post-colonial, and, and uh, Dr. Mustad has written about this, and others have written, you know, the idea of uh, um, exporting patriarchy or outsourcing patriarchy, right? So before, the idea was uh, Western people go to another country with brown and black people, and they say, you guys have problems of oppressing women. So you guys are the ones who have these problems. And by doing that, they take any focus off their own problems. So you, you take any focus off the problem of domestic violence in the U.S., of, of uh, you know, honor killings in the U.S., over economic injustice towards women in the United States. But this new movement says, no, no, we're actually willing to also criticize let's say, violence against women in the United States or economic injustice against women in the United States and Muslim countries, but then you have to look at what the consequences are. For, con for Muslim countries, it involves those people having to, as I said, deny and dismantle their very religious systems. So they have to say, equivalent, essentially, the Quran is not a gendered text. They have to say, for example, in Islam, that gender means absolutely nothing. Uh, gender should mean actually absolutely nothing in any society, period, and uh, certainly not in any religion. So Muslims have to deny something that's very obvious in the Quran. They have to deny something very clear in their religious law. They have to deny something that's pretty clear just in human society in general. Now, uh, that's disastrous for Muslims. But if you look at what this same kind of uh, school of thought is calling for in the United States, yes, they will be very critical of patriarchy in the United States. They'll be very critical of uh, men abusing women. They'll be very critical of sexual uh, um, harassment of women and things like that. But they don't challenge the underlying structure of that society. They don't challenge the underlying capitalist structure. They don't un uh, challenge the under underlying institutional structure. They just challenge who has power within the structures. Within those structures. So, uh, if the modern, if the kind of, if Islamic modernism was about creating an Islam that is appealing and acceptable to essentially late 19th century, early 27th, 20th century uh, European Protestant modern lifestyle, this um, postmodern Islam is about uh, creating Islam that is totally dismantled and what's left in its place? By default, basically, the lifestyle of these university professors, which is urban, liberal, consumer capitalist. Urban, liberal, consumer capitalist. There's nothing, there's no vision to replace it. There's no religion to replace it. And this group doesn't have any buy-in from the Muslim community in the West yet. But again, if you'd asked me when I was a grad school student in 2002 or 2003, or if I thought the RAND report was going to work, I would have said, no, no, of course not. Muslims will never accept this. Guess what? Muslims in the United States, institutionally, at least in educational institutions, have accepted it. This has now become the norm. And so how much longer? Is it, only, is, is it just going to be a matter of decades before even the Muslim population, the, the, the practicing Muslim community in the United States and other Western countries allows themselves to be guided not by their community leaders and traditional scholars or people who have integrity uh, and commitment to the Islamic tradition and to, to living it and understanding it in the modern world? Or is it going to be guided by people whose uh, job it is, has always been to dismantle uh, Islam, Islamic history, and uh, the notion of the Islamic world? Jazakumullah khair. I hope that's not the answer, by the way. Jazakumullah khair. Thank you very much for your thought-provoking presentation, Dr. Brown. Our third speaker is Dr. Loi Safi, who will be sharing with us his presentation on the impact of the modern states on how, sh how Sharia relates to the public sphere and exploring ways to reconcile Sharia with modern governance. The floor is yours, Dr. Safi. Okay, thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and good, good evening to all of you, and uh, <clears throat> it has been a very, very good informative day. Thank you, Dr. Sami, for gathering this group of people to discuss issues that really we all care about. Now, 
The title of my uh, presentation is Sharia and the nation state. These are two loaded terms that um, <clears throat> really I can't do justice to them in the, in the scope of 20 minutes. What I can do is to raise some issues to provoke your thinking about those terms because they are important. Now, I just heard, and you have just heard, that <clears throat> there is a temporal dimension to the term Sharia, the term Islam. I mean, there's a temporal dimension that we have to explore, we have to understand. And there is a temporal dimension to the notion of state. State has not started um, with Westphalia, Westphalia uh, um, treaty uh, or, or a truce or agreement. It has been all with us for uh, as much as uh, there has been human civilization. The state has been always central for the development of human society. And the Sharia really has been with us for a long, long time. In fact, the Quran tells us that Sharia didn't start as a term or as a notion with the Muslims. It has been there before as I'll point out in a minute. <clears throat> and so the, the task ahead of me is really to try to, to de-entangle um, the term Sharia from another term that has been attached to it, and most of us use them inter interchangeably, the term of fiqh. Many of us, when we hear Sharia, we think fiqh. So what's Sharia? Is the ahkam al-shari'a. I would like to propose that this is really a misconception of Sharia. Sharia is not Ahkam Sharia. Ahkam Sharia is what we call Fiqh. And Fiqh is the outcome of the struggle or ishtihad of our scholars to try to make sense of revelation in their own temporal, that is social context, historical context. The Sharia, the Fiqh has been developed by transient individuals who lived in particular societies, grew up in particular cultures, faced certain issues and problems, had to compromise, you know, because nothing can happen, particularly in the area of uh, law, without compromising different forces in society. And uh, <clears throat> perhaps the most that compromised were the, the Sunni scholars, particularly in the area of the state. They have to compromise with the, the de facto powerful tribes that were controlling the state and out of bound. All they could do is to, uh, to draw a circle around them and tell them, this is your area, you can move. Probably will not be able to check what you are doing there, but outside it, don't move without being in violation with, of our beliefs. And in fact, Sharia historically was developed in a way to limit the power of the state, not to be an instrument of the state as some contemporary Muslim thing, they want to make it an instrument of the state. Um, <clears throat> now let me first of all say that Sharia <clears throat> is essentially, I mean, if you like to strip it into its, to its bone, to its more essential elements, Sharia is a value system. And the use of elements of it in a legal context is not automatic in Islam. You can't say this is Sharia, then this is what is required and has to be imposed on people in the public uh, square. <laughs> there is a requirement for that to happen. There is a requirement of social con consensus. There, mu there must be a consensual uh, a process in society, and this consensual process was there. Of course, many of us, we don't see it. In other words, there must be a social agency for the implementation of Sharia. No individual can say, this is what the Prophet said, or this is what the Quran says, and then this is what you have to do. This fallacy of, of moving in terms of fatwas from, you know, from looking at the text into promulgating certain rules is contrary to Sharia and contrary to even social, uh, you know, normative behavior. Um, one of my favorite definition of Sharia is by Al-Az bin Abd al-Salam, Az bin Abd al-Salam, a, a towering figure in the, in the history of fiqh. And he defines Sharia, he says, Sharia 
كلها نصائح الشريعة كلها نصائح لجلب المصالح ودرء المفاسد very nice so he says شريعة, all of Sharia Sharia comprises of advices of, of advice for bringing you know benefits and avoiding harms um, and in fact this is very insightful uh, of course you're all aware that our early scholars have discovered that not every order in the Quran has to be translated an order in terms of linguistic formation has to be translated into an order to be followed as a worship some orders can be just uh, an advice really uh, one, one good example is فَإِذَا قُدِيَةُ الصَّلَاةُ فَانْتَشِرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَابْتَغُوا مِنْ فَضْلِ اللَّهِ which the fuqaha said no this is not something that a, a must something that Muslims have to do but it's permissible for them to do that um, and so the first order I think for modern, modern Muslim society is to disentangle the notion of sharia from the notion of fuqah sharia as a basic concept involves the universal rules that have been revealed and symbolic acts. Only universal rules in the Quran or universal principles of, of, in the Quran and symbolic rules can be called Sharia. Because by definition Sharia is good for all time and all times and all places, right? That's what is Sharia. And the only thing that is good for all times and all places is the universal and the symbolic. Um, and this, of course, understanding, you know, is not a new one. In fact, it has been there in the writings of early scholars. Unfortunately, today we don't read our, our original work. We understand it through a process of extrapolation. We extrapolate from the present to the past, and then we misunderstand the past. Um, for example, early scholars distinguished between what they called ahkam ta'abudiyya um, or nusus ta'abudiyya, uh, which are um, um, ritualistic texts or symbolic texts, I would like to, to, to call them, because they involve symbolic acts like salah and siyam. These are symbolic acts, meaning that the, the meaning of them comes out of practicing those acts. They don't have meaning on their own. You have to practice them to, to, to extract the meaning out of that practice. Those are part of Sharia that is universal, like Siyam, Salah. And in fact, it has been universal not only for Muslims, some, someone like Abu Bakr uh, ibn Arabi, um, the well-known uh, scholar who wrote Ahkam al-Quran, he argued that um, these are the universal elements that, that are shared by Muslims and people of the book before them. That in all revelation, there always have been a, a, a direction uh, toward prayer and siyam and hajj. Um, and, and therefore, but of course, it has taken different form and shape. But this injunction has always been there. In fact, he goes on to say that there is a universal sharia. Uh, or what I would like to call a, a, a general notion of Sharia. Sharia that is shared by all religions that have been revealed by Allah. And this is, of course, he, he expounded that meaning by looking at the ayah of Surah Ashura, uh, ayah 13, which says, Sharia lakum naddini ma wasayna bihi nuhan wasa bihi nuhan waladhi awhayna ilayk wa ma wasayna bihi Ibrahim or Musa or Isa. So there are, and then when he comes to, ex, to, expect, to explain what is that, he talks about al ahkam al ta'abudiyya, and then he talks about the universal values that are shared, but are like, like amana and sidq and uh, um, ta'awun. These are meanings that are revealed to all people. So Sharia has this general meaning which bring all people of the book, all people who have received the book, 
And I guess that's why we find some commonality between our own societies and societies that are not Muslim, like Western society, for example, or even, for that matter, Eastern societies. These principles, these values are enshrined in all religion. To be kind, to be just, to be, to be merciful, not to abuse your power. Of course, it fault always in, in implementation. So these are the shared sharia. But the, then the Quran also in Surah Al-Ma'idah, Ayah 48, talks about the particular sharia. Uh, the Quran says here, لِكُلَّنْ جَعَلْنَا مِنْكُمْ شُرَعَةً وَمِنْ هَاجَةً That to each of you we have ordained a particular sharia and a way. And then it goes on to say that it was, if it was the will of Allah, He would have made you all one ummah. But it has His will that you, and, and, and what, what should you do with that division? فَاسْتَبِقُوا khayrat, Compete in the good. And so, there is elements of sharia that is for Muslims, and there are elements that our Muslims can share with others. And why this is important? Because... This is the way to have societies that are constituted by different re religious communities, but then they have something in common, which is, which is important. Um, now, the translation of Sharia rules into constitutional and legal pronouncements requires a deeper understanding of the social agency and its institutions. So no one individual or sheikh or mufti can on his own, or her own, of course, we still have few muftis women, but no one can on his own uh, uh, make rules that are binding for the community. One of the important, and this has never been done in the past, by the way, um, Max Weber, when he wrote uh, um, uh, The Economy and Society, he accused the Qadi, or the Qazi, as he would call him in his German uh, um, accent. He accused him of being arbitrary, not, ab not abiding by, by, by precedent. So he could, um, in, one, in one time, have sent certain uh, pronouncement, and this would be in contradiction with another pronouncement that made by another Qadi elsewhere, even within the same tradition. Um, the interesting thing is that in this century, uh, a contemporary uh, a scholar with the name of Lawrence Rosen, he is a professor at Princeton, I don't know whether he's still teaching there, probably he has left, um, uh, but, but he has written a very interesting book, I advise you to read it, it's called uh, Law as Culture, and this book reflects his experience in the court of one traditional Qadi in Morocco, in an old town that, that the Qadi was, was ruling according to tradition. And he discovered that this Qadi is bound by the customs of the community, not by the Fuqah book. Yes, maybe Fuqah book is taught to the people. These are the rules. But then what has to be implemented would be what has been accepted by the community, not by the Qadi. He doesn't go into, and so he argued that this Qadi, rather than being arbitrary, he is constrained by the consensus or by a urf of the community. And as you know, urf has always been an important part of Sharia. And that's the temporal dimension of Sharia, of Fuqa, as opposed to Sharia. So, um, therefore, to translate, thank you, to translate Sharia into rules that, that bonding society, then this must be a consensual process that involved everyone. Let me move on to talk about, about the nation state because this is part of the, and I hope I'll have a couple of minutes maybe to conclude, but I'll say briefly, the nation state of course is a very uh, modern concept. And some of us, of course, it has many connotations and meanings, to be honest with you. I don't have time to expand that, but what matters to me when I hear the word nation state is the notion of equal citizenship. And why is that important? Because equal, equal citizenship is the instrument today that has been devised to control those who, who are in power through elections and accountability to the electorate. This was never possible in empires. Empires, you can't have really elections in an empire that, that, that you know, cross over three continents. 
but it can be done in a, in a physically, territorially uh, limited space. And I think we have to pay attention as people who care about Islam about this. So we have talked about the Ummah, but the Ummah is a very, uh, very conceptual idea that has to be expanded further. Maybe you have done that last year, but really it's very problematic as we use it today. Um, but even if we believe in Ummah, this Ummah has, on the political level, has to be constituted of, of territorial states with equal citizenship for every one of them so they can control their rulers. The, these rulers cannot be given in, 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 you know, impunity. You know, rule, we believe in you, you look like to us very pious and you will not do wrong. No, they will do wrong. Unless there is accountability. Um, and that's the nature of human beings. Without accountability, no human being will, will survive corruption. All will be corrupt without somebody asking us what are we doing with this money and why we are ruling in this way, why are we appointing this guy here and there. And Muslims should know better because the Sahaba, who we really respect greatly, failed in this area. Failed in this area. That's another, another talk. And so uh, to, to bring this into uh, you know, some sort of a better uh, understanding. Let me say that Muslim society have historically developed a dual system of governance. So, 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 so Sharia has to be implemented through governance and not through the muftis and the shiuch, you know, sitting in the masajid and saying this is how things should be run. No, it has to be it's through a system of governance. And Muslims have really developed that system of governance. I call it the dual system of governance that reflected the dual nature of Sharia. Historical Muslim society distinguished between the universal Sharia that founded on the intrinsic human values. Definitely, I mean, the Quran tells us very clearly that, that, that those rules that was revealed were revealed for humanity. I mean, the whole notion of humanistic rules are born f from revelation, religion. Rahmatan lil alameen, the Prophet was not the Prophet of, you know, rahmah to his own congregation or followers. He was rahmatan lil alameen. And whenever I see word alameen in the Quran, I see insaniyah, humanistic. Of course, one can argue it is even beyond that, but let us at least accept that the word alameen in the Quran is about humanity. So you have to be good not only for your kind, for human being. And that's uh, where, where, where we need to focus on our attention. Historical Muslim, okay, so, so let me, without reading a lot, because I'm running out of time, I mean, let us look at this dual system that the last thing we know about Islamic governance is the Ottoman, Ottoman uh, Empire, right? But this empire, impl okay, so I'm having two minutes, according to my watch. Um, so this empire ruled through a system called the millet system millet system, which gave, gave autonomy to the different confessional communities that lived in that. So every confessional community could have its own laws, its own language, its own rulers, administrators. And there was a common covenant that combined all of them together. I'm not suggesting let us re 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 revive this, this can't be revived. But when we think about modern state and political governance for Muslims, we have to bring to our attention to the fact that we can't talk about Islamic state that forces every resident, every citizen there to follow the Sharia in uh, equal, uh, you know, uh, equal fiqh. That would be injustice. That would be unjust. We have, you have Christians, you have, you have Jews, you have, uh, I don't know, in, in India you have also Hindus. You can't force them. And, and our, our early Muslims never forced those who are or, 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 who, who are of different religion to follow the Sharia and the way some of those fundamentalists or, or yani, Mutashadidun, I'm using that in the Western uh, connotation, those, those al Mutashadidun, they want really to impl implement Sharia the way they understand it as fiqh on everybody. And that's really contrary to the spirit of Islam. Um, and so I'll, I'm going to conclude here. Uh, thank you for your patience. And probably I still have a couple of seconds, but I'm going to give, give, give them up to you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much for your enlightening presentation, Dr. Safi. 
Uh, with that, I would like to open the floor to discussion. Uh, we have around 35 minutes for questions and answers, 20 minutes for questions, then 12 minutes in total, and four minutes for each speaker to address the questions. Um, Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Um, again, another wonderful panel. Um, I had a question for Jonathan, and actually, uh, it's, uh, uh, I guess it's going to be a little bit controversial. So, um, you were talking about not, you know, Muslims, for example, in America, not trusting their Muslim leaders. And I find not only in the United States, but just all over, that people are complaining about a dearth of Muslim leaders. So, for example, I speak to, uh, you've heard of IVLP, the State Department brings uh, groups of people to the United States that they've uh, sort of gathered from uh, different countries, and I, I speak to these people several times a year, and they come from Muslim countries, they come from uh, Iraq, the Kurdish regions of Iraq and Germany and everything. These are small groups of, of uh, high-level Muslims, I mean high-level in terms of uh, in government or in whatever organizations. And I find that many of them have very, very progressive, very sort of open and wonderful, you know, creative views about um, Islam and how Islam should be practiced today. And they're very dedicated. But here's what they say to me. They say, we don't have any shuyukh. We're, we're doing this on our own. You know, the, this, the uh, leader of the religious organization in, um, in uh, Irbil said, I, I, I'm lost because I'm making it up as I go along because I look for shuyukh, but I can't find anybody to give me guidance in a way that would be useful for me in Iraq and that would be useful in terms of what I believe in. So, you know, I think, and certainly the women that I know uh, who are much better than I am in terms of their, you know, Islamic understanding, they're also saying, where, who are the, where's the shuyukh? You know, so we're, people are hungry for this, but there, there, aren't, there aren't the kinds of leaders with the depth of understanding that that people are looking for. It's supposed to be a question. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. So the the people you were talking yeah. about. Uh, oh. Sorry. First, for first twenty minutes for questions, then the speakers will address them. Well, mine is not really actually, actually a question, but rather I would like to comment on a number of things, particularly Jonathan Brown when what he brought around. I would agree with uh, Dr. Yunus same time said, and we all know this verse. So far my understanding is that Islam is not really, of course it is, you know, has come to the everyone. Muslims or non-Muslims, in fact, are tied up with these, you know, laws. If a, even if a Christian or a non-Christian, whatever it is, when they convert into Islam, they have to accept these laws. And at the same time, I just you know, to, want to comment on a number of things. Now, in Western countries, of course, the women are not paid you know, as, men, as much as the men are paid. We all know that, particularly you know, depending, let's say, well, they are not really strong enough with men, and they are not, at the same time, working enough, and at the same time, they, they, get, you know, they have child, and they can look after their kids, so therefore, we do not give them enough pay. So can, there is no way that you can change this. In the future, when you say we are now progressive, modern, or whatever it is, can you change this law? Can you say that no, we have to pay, you know, the women are equal to men, and therefore we have to pay them equally? So I probably misunderstood when you have, you know, brought up the question of the riba, zina, and at the same time the distribution of the, uh, what do you call, uh, what do they call it? It is uh, inheritance. All of these, of course, to my understanding that you are saying, you know, with the modern world, with the progressive, they should change, all right? But let's say with the riba, let's say we changed it and we accepted it. Are you going to guarantee the people who actually misuse it? There's I no way you say, can. I didn't say that. I, I, think I probably can, misunderstood, yeah, but I'm not I saying, didn't it say say that. yeah, all right? Or if it is zina or at the same time inheritance. With regard to inheritance, you know, when, Woman is really paid only one share, and the man is paid two shares. Now, here, of course, there is an explanation for Islam, and at the same time, we all know what it is. I'm not going to go into, into that, but at the same time, you cannot change the conditions for women 
in the future because they are all you know different creations and you know they have their own needs we cannot actually you know base on that and in time in the long time islam you know uh, what you are most of the people are saying okay it has to be changed according to modern time or according to progress in whatever it is i do not actually agree that islam make laws should change because there is no change in the quran quran says you know i've uh, i've been revealed this ayah and i am going to preserve it i may say i might have you know, misunderstood you but this is what i really had you know driven from that okay thank you thank you very much dr mehmati assalamu alaikum um thank you everyone so much for your talks Uh, my question is for Professor Lombard. Um, I guess one thing that I was thinking about um, during your talk is, inevitably, we are all, um, whether this is positive or negative, very impacted by modernity and by Western epistemology um, in ways that we know and don't know. So even if we do seek to approach the classical tradition, we're still doing it being tainted by modernity. Um, so could you maybe give us one example? of something like a contemporary issue a hot button issue that kind of really looks at this practically what an epistemic epistemic decolonization looks like um in favor of the classical islamic tradition and the lady in blue please Um I have a question for Dr. Luai Safi. Um so I do agree with you that sharia is being reduced to fiqh and it's more than that but I still do not understand your conception of sharia because you said al ahkam at ta'budiyah and then the universal principles but with this you overlook the world view what's universal now might not be universal in 100 years. Um so I think sharia is more than just the universal principles it's it's a way of life so if you can just um elaborate on that um Uh, yes, I think we can hear you, Zulal. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. No. Okay. Uh, my question for Dr. Uh, Joseph. Um, last point of you. Uh, I would like to ask you your uh, last point about the dialogue. You talked about the roots of knowledge. So um, in Turkey, Glenis Mewoods, Uh, was using the uh, dialogue as a tool of the um, manipulating the people in Turkey. So, uh, if we are talking about the divine knowledge and the uh, core knowledge, uh, do we ne really need a dialogue? Because it's not changing the people's mind. Like we have the uh, common ground with the Abrahamic religions, and uh, and we we can have a multi. Mm, faith discussions, but uh, multi-faith discussions is just, I think, um, how can I say, like contrasting us. So, uh, do we need really um, um, dialogue for the real knowledge, like for the Islamic view? Already we have real knowledge, I guess. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, the gentleman in blue, please. I have a question to Dr. Brown. Uh, he says that some situations are changing in diff uh, during the time and some other uh, cases. Um, nowadays, we have two parts of people. Uh, we're talking about the Ummah to live together despite differences. But um, in one part, we have people uh, who are uh, doing something because Prophet Muhammad Salam do it like miswak and people who are saying you don't have to use miswak anymore, you, it's enough to uh, use toothbrush. And they are conflicting and debating each other, but the main purpose is to have clean teeth. But uh, it's going to be a bigger debate, each other. How do we handle with that? Thank you very much. The gentleman in front, please. 
Um, excuse me. Ex here, please. Thank you very much. I have a question for Dr. Jonathan Brown. You said uh, ahkam can be or should be changed according to the requirements of the times and systems. I basically agree with, your, with this point. But as I understood by your words in some of your descriptions, you mangled ahkam and socio-economic laws of Islam somehow and, funda uh, and fundamental Islamic beliefs. For example, you mentioned Zina and believing on Quran as a holy, holy book of Allah in same context. Being a student of Islamic studies, we need to realize first that there is a big difference. There is a big difference between Islamic jurisprudence and Islamic faiths. These are, these are two different things. As I know, Islam does not stop us at any point from modifying, from modifying our civil laws according to the need of the times. But when I say, when it says Prophet Muhammad is the last messenger of Allah and Quran is the holy revealed book of Allah, a Muslim being a Muslim cannot accept any dogma against this. Still, we can have a logical discussion on both issues and the Muslims also need to convince others by why Islam does not permit any anyone including the believers and Muslims for any change in the fundamental Islamic faith. Logical discussion is always welcome, but it needs also some logical evidences. Thank you very much. Um, the lady in black, please. Um, yes, please, both of okay. you. Um, hi, I have a question for Dr. Luaya Safi. Basically, um, you said that Sharia, it's individuals can't implement it, but rather the community has to form a consensus on it. Now, to my understanding, that sounds very democratic. And as we know, the problem with democ democracies, like Plato said, is the tyranny of the majority. So let's say the community doesn't have a very good understanding of Islam, let's say in the um, case of blasphemy or even wife beating some people, some Muslims believe like that's allowed in Islam. So let's say if the community doesn't have a very good understanding of it, then what is to prevent that Sharia from falling apart as well? Thank you very much. Yes, please. Um, thank you everyone for um, your um, speak. Um, I am from Colombia, so I come from an, um, a minority Muslim country. So my question is direct to Dr. Brown. Uh, what should the minority Muslim countries do in order to fight against these plans you said about the big companies or the big powers of the world? Um, and most importantly, what should we as minority country um, Muslims do um, to feel and actually be part of the Muslim Ummah because we feel like we had been uh, like laid apart from the Muslim uh, countries and we don't like really help, uh, feel like inside the Muslim community. And what should the Muslim countries do to like uh, help us or to make us feel inside the uh, Muslim Ummah? Thank you. There was a question here, I think. No? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you all here, uh, we really understand from your repre repre representation. 
my question is directly from Mr. Uh, Dr. Safi. Uh, my question is that why all uh, why mostly uh, mostly Muslim countries not following Sharia's um, like mostly countries they follow uh, civil or other laws. So, for example, even Turkey, even Turkey uh, not following Sharia's. For example, I can give an example. Uh, there was uh, a, per, uh, a person from Syria. He he was. Uh, he married uh, a girl 13 years, I think 14 years. So the police took him that why you uh, married him, uh, her. Uh, this is not in our rule. And uh, he was saying that it is uh, in Islam and it is, in, uh, it is uh, she is below and uh, she is allowed or I am allowed to marry each other. And uh, one thing, uh, just that much. All right. Thank you very much. The gentleman at the back, please. Assalamu alaikum. I just have a question for uh, Dr. Lombard and Dr. Brown. Uh, first of all, I'd like to ask what solutions you propose to the problems uh, you just presented. And um, also want to ask uh, how connected you think these solutions are with the uh, true human nature rather than just. Um, Informative, you know, like uh, we can inform people, for example, how to gain truth, how to disseminate truth. But in the end, they will follow their, their uh, nafs al-amara basu. For example, they will be attracted by uh, the halo that surrounds a person that's trying to, um, you know, purvey a certain piece of information or something. So uh, that's one point. And Dr. Safi, can you please uh, explain more the context of where you're coming from? Because I seem to see a some uh, disconnect between your position and Dr. Brown's position on traditional Muslims in regards to their uh, discussion with progressives. Thank you. Um, yes, the lady in the middle, please. Sorry, I have another question for Dr. Lai that I totally forgot to ask. Uh, because you mentioned that if we reduce Sharia to Fiqh, and then how are we going to implement it on non-Muslims? But you know, even in Fiqh, there, there is Fiqh of minorities. So the way you were speaking about implementing Sharia when there are non-Muslims was, like for me, it was, it was to be honest, Western projection and a bit orientalist because even in Sharia, even in the in the strictest uh, definitions of Sharia, minorities and non-Muslims are uh, like the, the rights are preserved and are very known. And it's it, like I think most of us know that non-Muslims are not obliged to follow what Muslims have to follow. So, uh, and also about the social agency. Um, uh, yes, we have to uh, all consent to apply the Sharia, but at the same time, social agency is limited by the Sharia itself. So if, if the society agrees that we will implement the Sharia and then at some point they all decide, let's say the parliament or whatever, they decide that they will uh, legalize something that it's is the haram and like it's not, it, it's not contested that it's haram, the Sharia will not like it shouldn't be approved because it's against Sharia. So even the social, it's the the social agency is not absolute; it's limited. Thank you very much. We have two minutes, so, so we can take two more questions. Um, the lady at the back, please. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, my question to Professor Luai Safi: um, uh, You mentioned here you're going to explore ways and means to reconcile the Sharia with the modern governance. Um, can you give example uh, practice by, is there any? Uh, because I know, uh, we know, we all know that um, most of uh, concept management um, uh, speaking about uh, governance and then this concept of governance, mainly we borrow from the West, which is uh, most of uh, some of them are uh, are having no problem with the Islamic Islamic uh, concept. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Final question. All right. Yes. Yes, please. Uh, the microphone is coming. Yes. 
Is it acceptable to ask a question of a, a questioner? Is that acceptable? No? Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Now, um, each speaker will have around four minutes to address your questions, starting with Dr. Lombard, please. All right, I'll, I'll address the three questions that were uh, posed to me in order. Um, first, uh, Hafsa's question. Thank you very much. That's actually, it's, it's a very good question, and, and I would say that uh, to answer the first part of, of your question, which is more of a statement, so we're all in modernity. Uh, we, we know this. Um, and, uh, and so we can't help but uh, look at this from within this, uh, in this position of, uh, of modernity. And uh, however, the problem is, is that we, uh, we tend to, in a sense, swim within it without understanding the environment that we're in, without analyzing it. And, look at, and, and, um, and so we can't deny that. And that's why at the end, I say to, to kind of go to the other question uh, up here, is that the dialogue, it has to exist because we have to acknowledge the existence of these other paradigms here. The point is not to say uh, be against modernity or necessarily even against secularism, but to be in dialogue with it and be conscious of what are the paradigms that are shaping the way in which we are conducting our disciplines, the way in which we are teaching our children, the reasons why we're all carrying around cell phones. Um, and uh, to, to get to some more concrete examples, um, we, uh, education is the place where we have some of the most concrete examples. Let's say, for example, I was teaching for three years at the American University of Sharjah. At the beginning of each semester, I asked my students, everybody who self-identifies as Arab, to raise their hands. Or raise their hands. Of those who self-identify as Arab, who knows the name Shakespeare? Everyone raises their hand. Who knows the name Al-Mutanabbi? About 15 to 20% raise their hand. Who has read Shakespeare? Usually about 80% raise their hand. Who has read Al-Mutanabbi? Uh, usually you get about 20% at most uh, who raise their hand. Sometimes I've had it where just one. So you have this situation where, where in, in terms of being a, an educated human being, it is completely conceptualized as being familiar with the greats of the Western tradition. If we were to come here into, into this very environment, I don't know anything about the, is there a department of philosophy at, the, at this university? You know what's that? No, all right, well then I can't give this example. But if you are to go, I know of some, of some other schools where there are departments of, uh, of philosophy, and most of it is, uh, is Western philosophy. And then there's one course, or maybe two, that are taught on Islamic philosophy, and they've kind of got their own little niche over to the side. And the students all want to be conversant with Habermas, or something along these lines, but they're not saying, oh, I want to read Taha Abdul Rahman. You know, and Taha Abdul Rahman has incredible analysis of the situation in which we all find ourselves today. So these are ways in which you would say on a, on a concrete example of what decolonization would look like. When we go into it in our own fields as academics, this is where we want to, to confront there are, as academics, we have young Muslim academics who are better trained in critical Western theory than they are in the texts of the tradition to which they are applying the critical theory. What the, the view is going to be is going to be by definition influenced by the lens through which you are looking at it in that case, especially if some of these don't even have the, ling the proper linguistic training. Uh, a good example of this would be to come in, for example, in, in my own field, in the field of Quranic studies. There are lots of people who accept a lot of this, I won't even call them theories, these are speculations regarding the history of the Quranic text and, the, and, the, uh, and a lot of linguistic dimensions. I mean, James Bellamy has written some articles on linguistic dimensions, or people will still go back and they'll refer to uh, uh, the, um, uh, who is the one who wrote the book on... Uh, uh, foreign words in the Quran. And they'll refer to these books as these great works in the field of early times without even really going in and analyzing some of, of the paradigms that they were applying to this. Um, and so you, uh, and so you, and this is young Muslims who are actually saying some of these things without actually going in there and saying, wait a minute, okay, 
What did they actually say? How does this actually compare to the tradition? Do you want to know what happened to the one professor who did absolutely, completely, and utter paradigm-shifting work that told everybody that you have to look at the early history as written by Muslims regarding the text of the Quran. You know what happened? His work is the, the most downloaded work from uh, Der Islam in like the last 10 years, all right? Field defining, he didn't get tenure. Why? All right, we're talking about people who changed the field. They don't get tenure because they smashed the paradigm. And a lot of Muslims aren't sitting there and understanding how and why that happened. Um, I would go on, there's, there's lots of dimensions to this, but let me go on to the next question. As regards dialogue, as I was saying in answering Hafsa's question, uh, dialogue is necessary because we're in the situation that we're in. Yes, you can have somebody sitting in Hadramaut and learning the traditional Islamic sciences and com living a completely, uh, a, a completely Islamic life according to the classical teachings, and there is no requirement necessarily for that person to be in dialogue. Out in the deserts of Mauritania, alhamdulillah, beautiful life, I would love to live it. That's not where we are, all right? And so by virtue of the context in which we are, we need to be conscientious of these factors that are impacting and shaping that environment and be in dialogue in that way. And we have to be in dialogue with them from a point of cognitive confidence epistemic confidence and hermeneutic confidence. And that right now is something that is, uh, that is very rarely found. And again, I would go back, Taha Abdul Rahman is one of those people who is in dialogue from a point of epistemic and hermeneutic confidence, but he's not widely read enough. Um, and last, the other question was, um, what uh, solutions would be proposed to the problems that are connected to those of the true human nature? All right, I've proposed some of those solutions already in talking to, uh, to Hafsaf's question. Um, but uh, in terms of how these things would relate to true human nature, well, this is where it comes back to the whole paradigm that I'm talking about. It would, we could call it, in a sense, a fitra paradigm. What, how do we as Muslims conceptualize the human being? All right, we don't conceptualize. The, in our tradition, the human being is not a fallen being that needs the hand of, 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 of the Messiah to drag him out of the mire of the dunya. Um, you know, the human being, which is, would be kind of the Christian model, the human being is one that, in a sense, has this capacity to really to know you know, to, to, through the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put him, and through that covenantal relationship, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and the whole of humanity said, Bala, indeed. Through that covenantal relationship that's in our fitra, we have this kind of primordial knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in a sense, you spoke about nafs al amara basu, and that in a, is in a sense exactly the issue. You know, go to where the Quran then speaks of an nafs al lawama. La uqsimu bin nafs al lawama wa la uqsimu bil. Huh? Bi eh? Bi yom al qiyama. You know, look at that connection. Bi yom al qiyama and the nafs al lawama at the same thing. Believe in the hereafter and that blaming soul that, you know, that, that takes account of what and who it is is. It is in our nature. And it's very interesting that later on, I can't get into the whole analysis of the surah right here, but later on in that surah, you know, You know, when you sit down at the end of the day, you know who you are. And you really look at who you are. All right? No matter what excuses you're going to throw out there, in the depths of our being, the Quran is saying that we know who we are, and it's very interesting that after that, it then tells us not to be rushed in reading with the Qur'an, no, but to sit down there and contemplate it and follow the, the, the explanation of the text that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us, that actually through the contemplation of this book, we will actually be able to be in a position to better, to, to come to that knowledge of, of, our, of ourselves. So yes, I think that in fact this is actually in complete accord with what our tradition tells us we are as human beings in an eternal covenantal relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, please. Uh, okay, assalamu alaikum. 
Um, you know, it's whenever, whenever I give speeches, I, I always think I should just stop giving speeches because I, I think I'm just very bad at communicating. Either that or no one can understand me when I talk, which actually I think might be the case. Um, so I, I don't, uh, did not uh, say that those rules should change. Uh, I specifically said to الأحكام تتغير بالمكان والزمان والأشخاص والأنظمة. These are rulings changed by time, place, in people and uh, individuals involved and systems. That's الأحكام غير المجتهد فيه فيها, right? These are the rule, the um, the rulings that are not like mansus عليها or معلوم uh, الدين بالضرورة, not rulings that are known essentially as part of the religion, not rulings that are agreed upon by everybody, not rulings that are clearly stated in, in scripture. But rulings that are uh, like the vast majority of rulings in the Sharia, products of legal reasoning, hermeneutics of one sort or the other. For example, so in, a, an example of changing within a medheb would be like the early Hanafis are very strict about what kind of conditions you can put on a sale or a contract, whereas uh, after the 1100s, Hanafis basically defer to local custom on that as long as it doesn't contravene the clear Sharia. Between medhebs, a good example would be like. Um, uh, what happens if a woman's married and the woman converts to Islam? She's not, so uh, some people would say she has to divorce her husband. Other opinions would say, no, she can stay with her husband. So if you have a situation like the United States where you have a lot of women converting to Islam and their husbands are not Muslim, uh, it's very disruptive and damaging to their lives and to their family if they have to divorce their wife. So in that case, you would take the medheb that would allow her to stay with her with her husband, even though he's not Muslim. And that, and you would take, let's say, the, the Shafi or even the Imami Shiite Medheb, which would say that she can ra raise her child as a Muslim, even though the other Medhebs would say, no, the, the, the child should follow the religion of the father. Um, on the example of the Mizwak, I mean, yeah, there you are. So, I mean, this is a perfect example of this debate, uh, you know, tension between things changing and saying this, uh, are things, did God, uh, instruct the prophet to have this, the mizwak as his sunnah because Muslims are supposed to use the mizwak forever or is it because Muslims are supposed to clean their teeth by whatever the best technology is available and you see this legal reasoning at play very early on in Islamic history with the case of um, uh, الكلب في الإناء. so the hadith says that if uh, a dog licks or drinks from one of the, your vessels like for a drinking vessel or eating vessel you should wash it either seven or eight times depending on the duration the last time you use dirt and so should we use dirt, like in, for example, if a dog comes and licks my pants, should I use dirt to clean my pants or should I use soap? And even very early on in the 900s, you see Muslim scholars saying, no, no, this is, you, you can use soap, but they didn't have soap at the time in, in that area. So they didn't, uh, it was just whatever, that was, mud is like the best, sand is the best way to clean things, especially if they're like a vessel, uh, a hard vessel. And, uh, but then the issue is, you know, do you have, um, thank you, uh, uh, is there some like uh, tabudi, aspect to Mizwak as well. So yes, I clean, I, maybe I brush my teeth uh, with the latest, uh, you know, like my kids have, you know, vibrating, glow, light glowing toothbrush. Um, but also I use the Mizwak because this is just Sunnah and I'm trying to imitate the life of the Prophet ﷺ in every way that I can, so I have the Mizwak with me as well. And then we might discover Mizwak has also other benefits and maybe it does some things that toothbrush don't. So, um, but that's the kind of constant uh, dialogue Muslim scholars are engaged in. Uh, but the problem is today that dialogue is very difficult. It's almost impossible to have in a, in a, in a, in a because you can't have it in a, in a communal vacuum. You're constantly being pushed on and pulled on by the forces outside your community. Um, the the uh, State Department, I, I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't say Muslims don't have trust in their, rule, in their leaders um, in the Muslim community. Um, I think that because, let's say, Muslim community in the United States is so, under so many pressures, domestically, internationally, internally, et cetera, et cetera, it's, it's any, the more pressure a community is under, the more problems it has, the harder it's going to be for them to be able to find leaders that they find, uh, that, they, that, that help them or that, that, that they feel understand them, understand the situation. With the State Department, I mean, I would be, I would be uh, cautious about the people that the State Department, I mean, I, I've done the same thing, and I even saw the times people were very nice, but you have to remember these people have been vetted by the State Department, right? So they're not gonna they're not gonna bring, you know, Ayatollah Shamola or whatever. You know, they're gonna bring <laughs> that's just a name I made up, sorry about that. They're, they're gonna bring, you know, someone whose views are not obnoxious to the American government. Uh, the uh, interesting thing about um, the minorities that uh, uh, young lady from Colombia, first of all it's very nice to hear about Muslims in Colombia. I would say, you know, don't get me into this, but you know I'm very conflicted about this myself. But Muslims need to, you know, Muslim minorities need to be strong about their identity. They need to mark their identity with their dress and their, and their with the way they talk. 
uh, they need to not uh, accept excuses, allow them to blend in, because when you blend in, you disappear. And uh, the, in terms of what the Muslim world can do for you or for us or for most Muslim minorities, I think one of the best things they can do is offer a chance for education, let Muslims go to those countries and, and uh, learn classical Islamic sciences. What they should not do is put political conditions on that. You know, don't make Muslims in Colombia or in the U.S. Uh, have to uh, support whatever agenda of whatever government uh, in order to get funding, uh, or at least opportunities for education. And then the last question um, the, about what the solution is, you know, I, I think that it, there, is, there, there is no solution other than I think just about these epistemological problems is to be strong. You have to be strong. You have to be confident. And you also have to understand that you, when you start brushing, in, in any system, there are carrots and there are sticks, right? If you're doing what people, if you're doing what the powerful want, you get given lots of carrots. If you start doing what the powerful don't want, you start getting hit by the stick. And when you start, so when you start feeling uncomfortable about something, about, do I really want to say this? You sort of start, you'll, you'll internalize these, you'll self-censor. Ask yourself, you know, am I really going to obey these rules? Or am I going to, you know, am I going to ask myself, what do I believe? Where do I get knowledge? Where do I get truth from? If you believe you get truth from a certain source, and that certain source is saying X, and you're not saying X because you're afraid, then you need to, to be stronger and, and speak out. That's what I would say. That's uh, maybe the only solution I know of. Thank you very much. Uh, let, let me profess my answers by saying, really, I don't want us really all here or elsewhere to think that everything that is modern and Western should be avoided. I mean, this is, let me say, this is a ridiculous concept. You know? The West has inherited human civilization. Part of what Western civilization is universal. It's a human. Part of it, it is peculiar to European experience, you know? So we have to be critical. We have to develop our thinking, our critical thinking, and distinguish between what is useful and founded on right principle and argument and what is really uh, peculiar to Western experience and we don't have to import it, particularly when it violates our own values and our own authentic experiences. I would say that is even true about the heritage that we have. We can't follow the, everything the, 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 our fathers have, have promoted just because you know, we, we are of that uh, community. That's contrary to the, to the spirit of Islam. We can't say, you know, we should not ban our ummatin because that's what the Quran challenged the, uh, the, the community uh, of, of Quraysh when they wanted just to follow the tradition without thinking. Now, having said that, let me say the following. Now, I would like to say a few words about the, this word agency. Now, agency, of course, can be social, can be political, can be moral. I mean, we, we all have moral agency. And really, this is what Khilafah is. The meaning of Khilaf and the Qur'an that we are moral agents. We are free to make our own decisions and be held responsible for our decisions. Are we going to be truthful or are we going to be corrupt? That would be the test. And so when, when I... Um, for the question about universal principle, I agree with you. It's, it's a quite, it's a quite uh, difficult argument to be reduced in 20 minutes. I have written... A 500 book last year was published last year called the Sharia al Mushtara. It's in Arabic. Um, I have been writing in Arabic. I think our board really has more troubles in, in conceptualizing a lot of things about Islam, and that's why I have been writing in Arabic for a while. And, and there, I can give you two examples about this universal. It is, it is at the heart of Sharia as properly understood. You know, the last sermon of the Prophet. Sallam, um, which is really his only hujja, but, but he passed away after that, sallallahu alayhi wa he, he, he pronounced three principles have become binding principles even for the enlightenment. The enlightenment scholars talk about these principles as limiting principles for the power of the state. Hifdu um, uh, uh, right to life, right to property, Allah, right to dignity, which I interpreted in, in, you know, in many books 
as really ability, dignity meaning to have a choice. That's what dignity. Take, my, take, take the choice of a human, they have no dignity. Dignity of a human is by having choice, which is liberty. Um, our scholars in the, in the first century talked about five maqasid al-sharia, which are all rights. In addition to the three, they added hifd al-aqli wa hifd al-dini. So these are the principles. So what I'm talking about here, I'm talking about universal, that um, uh, again, I, I said, I didn't have time to expound. I said there are some ahkam which is ta'abudiyya, meaning symbolic, we have to follow without, without thinking because the meaning is in the act. But everything else, we have to look at the meaning. That's not my words, that the word of Ibn Taymiyyah, before him, Al-Azb Abd al-Salam, before him, Juwaini and Al-Ghazali. The, any, we cannot follow statement by the Prophet or statement by the Quran if you don't understand what it means. In fact, we, we now do things against the zahir of the qawl of the, of the Prophet. So he said, لا تبيعوا المعدوم And scholars decided and discovered that no, we can, we can engage in بيع المعدوم which is the absent um, is a, is a, is a gharar, which is deception, is we can, we can avoid deception. So because they realize his, his injunction about the meaning, you know, why is bad, al-madum is, is prohibited? Because it leads to deception. So we have to think about the meaning. Not only the, 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 the surface meaning that, as many of those traditionalists, quote unquote, meaning, you know, Salafis. I'm sorry, I, 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 I provoked last time my good friend, uh, uh, Jack, when I said that, but I said, not, you know, in, in, a, in a good sense, I respect the, the, you know, the Salafis' right to say whatever, but I have the right also to criticize them when they say only Zahir al-Nas we have to follow. We, we can't look at the deeper meaning of the, of the text. Um, for the question of example of social agency, you know the Ijma. Ijma is a social agency among the ulama, but also there are some Ijma which is within the community. Uh, I, I gave example how the judge could not judge against, in fact, he used examples I encourage you to. He used example of a woman who, of course, the judge wanted her to go and, and talk with the parents, her parents and parents of her husband, and settle it outside of the court. And she insisted. She said, no, it's my right. I would like, to be, I would like you to order my husband to take me to a separate home because I'm having trouble with my in-laws. And Lauren said the judge was, was not happy, but he had to do it because it was the urf. Her right, and she knows her right. And she, she did, didn't have even an attorney to, def, to ask for, for her right because she knew her right. And so this is really an example of social agency. Now with regard to the question, your question, I mean, you have a good question. Why Muslim countries don't follow Sharia? I guess because really we, ha we don't study Sharia. We don't study Sharia today. We study only the, the work of early scholars who lived in a different time and situation. I mean, we have many of our great scholars today who, who refer to, let's say, someone like Al-Ghazali. My goodness, Ghazali lived in the fourth century, like 10 centuries ago. How could you consult him about something that's contemporary? And so that's the problem. Now, our, school, our scholars stopped producing irrelevant knowledge to our time, and therefore everybody else has to, to search for the West, where the scholarship there is very alive, you know, trying to develop theories and, and, and addressing questions. And so, no, you know, no wonder why our governments don't listen to our scholars. I mean, this is a problem, of course, um, because yes, Early, early societies allowed that to happen, but we can't ha allow it today. Why? Because today we can't be a functional uh, citizens in our societies if you don't have education. We have to finish at least high school, at least high school. And so when we marry a, a, a child, she doesn't know, know how to make a decision about her marriage. And so there, yeah, we can really say it is not acceptable, although it was acceptable. And we can justify basis on the Sharia, because Sharia look after the interests of, of, of a human being, isn't it? Her interest is, is really completely ignored when she is pushed into a marriage. She can't evaluate what kind of relationship. You know, what is marriage really at 14? Uh, 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 finally, I know Dr. Sami is 
standing, but let me give an example to my good, uh, good friend in the back. Um, she said, how do you reconcile, reconcile Sharia with, with modern state? Well, to me, Sharia calls for the accountability of the ruler, that nobody can claim impunity. Everybody is responsible. This was understood by the first one who has been elected or chosen, let's say, as the head of the political head of the community, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. He said, إِنِّي مُلِيتُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَلَسْتُ بِخَيْرِكُمْ إِنْ أَحْسَنْتُ فَعِنْ وَنَسَأْتُ فَقَوْمُونِي قَوْمُونِي is not really like some, some people think قَوْمُونِي meaning, you know, hit him or something. قَوْمُونِي evaluate me. تَقْوِيم تَقْوِيم is من القيمة. قَوْمُ عَمَلِي You know, let me know about what you think. Tell me that I went wrong there. So, I would like today to use this wonderful mechanism is imperfect. Maybe we should perfect it later, but let us start with it, which is electing people and holding, holding them accountable. This is something that was developed by Western society. I love it. And I should embrace it without feeling, well, I didn't develop it myself. Yeah, well, I mean, tough luck. But there is an element, as I said, in the West, which is a human. This is about holding rulers accountable. So I have to accept it. If I can come with another alternative that is su more suitable for me, that would be even better. But if I cannot, then at least let me do this. So that's, that's one example I'll conclude here. There are many things to say, but I hope we'll have uh, more discussion tomorrow when we have this uh, exchange uh, uh, tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, another wonderful panel. Please uh, give them a clap. I mean, today we've, we've heard from three different panels, and I think they have been all great. Uh, they're not designed to answer all questions, but to provoke your thoughts and your minds and to make you think about these issues. And hopefully we can engage in these conversations in the future, as well as in your classes with, the, with your professors. What's left here is just to uh, recognize our wonderful speakers here with some uh, parting certificates and plates. Dr. Lombard. Inshallah, tomorrow we'll start at 9.30 with another great panel. Please be here on time. It's going to be the challenge of nationalism, and we're going to hear from three wonderful speakers about the situation in the Indian subcontinent, Turkey, and the Arab world. So I hope to see you tomorrow morning.